It is a huge honor to bring back Dr. Steve Cutberth. I don't, don't bring many people back, but uh, Steve, you had, I, I loved your podcast last time, and I know you have like 48 million gazillion cases. And so after our last podcast, uh, I wanted to bring you back and have you go over some uh, more complicated cases. Um, just a bio in case you missed his uh, first podcast, um, Dr. Steve Cutberth private general dentist practice with focus on complex restorative dentistry in Waco, Texas since 1981, began and directs the Center for Aesthetic Restorative Dentistry in Dallas, Texas for the past 15 years. The center teaches five to 10 hands-on two-day Friday, Saturday lecture laboratory courses for practicing dentists. Each course builds on the previous course, porcelain veneers, crown and bridge, replacing missing teeth, especially in the aesthetic zone. Diagnosis and Treatment of Myofascial and Intraarticular Pain and Dysfunction, Restoring the Most Complex Cases, Including Severe Wear Cases, Restoring Vertical Dimension, Full and Partial Denture Stabilization with Small Diameter Implants. By the final course, the dentist should be able to confidently treatment plan and restore complex cases in conjunction with appropriate specialists. He's been married for 38 years to Sharon, has two daughters, Catherine and Caroline, living in Austin and Nashville, two great son-in-laws, an incredible five-year-old granddaughter named Genevieve. How are you doing today, Steve? Good, Howard. How are you? Good, good. What are you going to teach us today? We're going to talk about incre increasing vertical. We're, we're going to talk about full mouth reconstruction, and then we're going to wander into restoration of the severe wear case. Well, you know, whenever you talk about a full mouth restoration, the one thing that the first question comes out of their mouth is, can you increase the vertical or what, what happens if you change the vertical? Dentists are very, very nervous that if they change the vertical, the TMJ is going to go crazy and they're going to be in a world of turmoil. So I hope you cover that when you're going over these uh, complex restorative cases. They'll never be nervous about that again. They'll never be nervous about that again. Ready? Yeah. I'm ready. Rock and roll, buddy. All right. We're going to do, I'm going to go through a lecture format as a cue for what we're going to talk about. So the first thing we're going to talk about is just a basic full mouth reconstruction complex case. Now, remember, this is, this is golden real dentistry. This is not looking for people to put restorations on all their teeth. This is someone who uh, is desiring that or needs that. I love that, that photograph, don't you? <laughs> She's smoking a hundred dollar bill. Oh, she's got a skeleton. Lighting her cigarette with a hundred dollar bill. And a skeleton for a hand. So these are the things you've got to think about. See, that's why all of our courses build on the other. Because if you're not a world expert in occlusion and treatment of intraarticular and myofascial pain problems or problems and really understand the condyle disc assembly and all those things, you're going to, you're going to get into a world of hurt. So the first thing we think about, this is just, this is not increasing vertical. This is just full mouth reconstructions. The incisal plane, the occlusal plane, centricorrelation and occlusion. And by the way, if I had to give up everything I know about dentistry and only be left with one thing, it would be, occlusion, and especially centric relation. Centric relation is the beginning point of these complex cases. If you don't have centric relation, you ain't got nothing. We can talk about that later. We're going to talk about vertical dimension. There, there are some very famous people in dentistry that have said never increase vertical dimension, that people don't lose vertical dimension. Unfortunately, that's wrong. I hold these people in the highest esteem, but that's, that's just not right, and I'll show you why that's not right in a minute, and why it's not a problem increasing vertical dimension in appropriate cases. All right, so one of the things we're looking for is do we have enough tooth structure upon which to place a restoration, and we gain retention by either increasing vertical so you don't have to remove occlusal incisal tooth structure, endodontics for internal retention or periodontal crown lengthening to make the tooth longer. So you've got more retention that way. I want to assess crowding. 
missing teeth, hopeless teeth, the dentin, enamel, teeth condition, stress on the system. Are they bruxers or clinchers? Cost, time, patient compliance, hygiene. Once you've done this as long as I've done it and you have done as many cases <coughs> as we've done, we're doing these cases every day. You're very thoughtful in the beginning because you understand, especially in the severe wear cases, Howard, that we're going to talk about later. And I tell patients this, these cases are like restoring a NASCAR. You can have the greatest mechanic in the world restore a NASCAR, but there's going to be maintenance. There's going to be breakdown, and the patient needs to understand that going in. All right, so now this is just with a full mouth reconstruction. The incisal plane should blend into the occlusal plane. If I've got an uh, inappropriate incisal plane, occlusal plane, how am I going to fix that? Centric relation and centric occlusion. What's the condition of the disc? Because the disc, oftentimes, if you have a severe wear case, the disc is going to be in about the same condition that the uh, teeth are in. Vertical dimension. Endodontics. These are ways of gaining retention for restorations. Vertical dimension, you just don't have to reduce much incisal occlusal tooth structure. Endodontics, we're gaining retention internally or periodontal crown lengthening. And remember, periodontal crown lengthening is not just gingivectomy. The body is going to reestablish the biologic width, which is a gingival line approximately three millimeters from the, uh, the uh, bone level. And so if you only do gingivectomy, the gingival will grow back and reestablish that three millimeter uh, distance. So you've got to remove bone and soft tissue in a case like this. We've done crown lengthening and porcelain veneers. Crowding, what am I going to do about that? Can you restore the teeth, the crowded teeth, without orthodontics. Now I'm a big fan of orthodontics, but oftentimes you, if you're going to restore all the teeth anyway, you can, you can sometimes do that without orthodontics as long as you end up with a healthy result that the patient can clean, uh, it's functional, all those things. The condition of the enamel, dentin, and teeth. You don't just jump into these cases. Stress on the system. Cost. Time. This should be appropriate dentistry, and that's why we spend so much time on the front end visiting with the patient to find out who's connected to the teeth and why are we doing whatever we do. Patient compliance and hygiene. Are they going to take care of it? Because no matter what you say, at the end of the day, that patient is going to hold you responsible for, for the restoration. So don't get into something that's not going to stand up. All right. So in a full mouth case, without increasing vertical, phase one going to be the pre-exam interview, the comprehensive exam, and the wax up, and then the consultation. The interview is just to find out who's connected to the teeth. Why are you here? The comprehensive exam is just what we say. We don't do anything definitive for a patient dentally until we've done a comprehensive exam. The only thing we'll do before a comprehensive exam is get them out of pain. <coughs> if they've got a toothache or something like that, we'll take care of that. But we don't do any crowns or anything else definitive until we've done a comprehensive exam. It's, I, I often say I'm really a home remodeler, and before I remodel somebody's kitchen, I want to analyze the whole house. How's the foundation? How's the walls? I want to talk to the person that's having the kitchen redone and say, tell me about the rest of the house. We're going to do anything to the rest of the house. We're going to knock out any walls. We're going to change the floor plan. We're going to 
redo the wallpaper. I want to know those things before I do any definitive work on a patient. Then wax it up. You know what you get. You know exactly what you can do from the wax up. And then we have a separate definitive consultation. And at that appointment, we talk about the condition of the patient's teeth and what their treatment options are if they want to proceed with treatment. Remember, it's not just about the patient, it's about you, the dentist, because your reputation is on the line with every case we do, as you know, Howard. Oral hygiene instruction, pro for your scaling and root planing, then extract the hopeless teeth, endodontics if needed. Periodontal crown lengthening. Again, we're, we're, we're creating situations to gain retention on those teeth for the restorations. Phase three, provisionalize and restore the mandibular anterior teeth to the second bicuspid or the first molar. Then provisionalize and restore the maxillary anterior teeth. We do the front teeth first. You know why? Why? It's like the front wheel of a tricycle. Your eccentric movements are on the, it should ideally be on the anterior teeth. So you want to work that out first. Then you plug in the posterior teeth and you want the, you don't want any eccentric contacts on those teeth. Do you know why that is? Because they're, they're close to the big muscles, the master, the medial pterygoid, the temporalis are all back in the back of the mouth. So that's where most of the pressure comes from. If only the anterior teeth are contacting, that's like crack, trying to crack an egg with your arms extended way in front of you and the egg between your fingertips. There's not much pressure out there. If you want to crack that egg, you're going to bring your hands back close to your body and press right there and you'll crush it in a second. So when the, the patient moves side to side, you want those, those movements away from the big muscles. If those movements are on the posterior teeth, you're, you're going to put too much pressure on those posterior teeth. You're going to split them, crack them, etc. You only want the posterior teeth, especially the molar teeth, to contact when the patient bites straight down. So you work out the eccentric movements on the anterior teeth first. Okay, so here are the lower teeth. Now, why do you leave one tooth not prepped? <clears throat> In this case, the second molars. It maintains your vertical dimension because we're not increasing vertical dimension. So we restored the mandibular anterior teeth. Now we restore the maxillary anterior teeth. You can see I've left the second molars unprepped. Veneers on uh, bicuspids to bicuspids. Then phase four is provisionalize and restore the maxillary and mandibular molars. Now, if you're doing the molars at the same time, it's very important when you place the provisionals. These are provisionals on the second and first molars that you place the provisionals and then you roughen the occlusal surface of the lower molar provisionals, squirt on some bisacrylate, place microfilm on the maxillary uh, provisionals on the molar teeth and have, and have the patient close together hard, squeeze hard into that unset bisacrylate. Let that set up Mark it with a pencil, mark the stops with a pencil, remove all the wings and leave those stops. That way you know those teeth are not going to super erupt between the prep phase and the seat prep phase. Then seat uh, the molar crowns and you can either use gold occlusal or Emax is really good. Then Night, uh, night guard, three much recall, and uh, oral hygiene instruction. Okay, now let's switch to what we came to talk about today, restoring the severe wear case. Don't forget, these cases are like restoring a NASCAR. It's very important 
that you spend time on the front end with the patient, not only in conversation, but in writing, talking about the maintenance. And I'm not, I really don't worry about litigation. I worry about relationships. And I don't want somebody getting into something that they don't know what they're getting into. That's why we write this out and have them sign it and read it to them just so they know that they have a big problem. And I don't want their big problem to become my big problem. So these are the checkpoints for restoring a severe wear case. The main points again are centric relation. Now remember, that's where you start. I know there's some groups that, that question centric relation. No, name one joint in the body in which the condyle is not supposed to be maximally, maximally seated in the fossa when that joint is under stress, Howard. Can you name one? Tell us. There is none. When you're running on your knee, don't you want that condyle to be seated maximally in the fossa when you're running on that knee? Well, the only time occlusion makes a difference is when the person's squeezing together. And when that happens, you want that condyle to be seated maximally in the fossa. We can talk about that on another cast if you want to. The incisal edge position. Well, I published an article on this a couple of years ago on the lip position versus incisal plane. You've got three types of lips. The flat lip, the moderately arched lip, and the maximally arched lip. Now, you can only use the flat lip to help determine incisal plane. And we used to say, remember in dental school, we mm -hmm. said you want two millimeters of incisal edge uh, displayed when the lips in repose. You remember that? Mm -hmm. That's crazy. If you've got somebody, I can show you uh, a presentation I make on lip position and there with a maximally arched lip when the person just lets her lip go in repose, she displays the whole tooth. A moderately arched lip, they're going to display half a tooth with lips in repose. So the only time you can use the lip, the upper lip, as a guide for incisal edge position of the maxillary anterior teeth is if it's a flat lip. Most men have flat lips in repose. We can talk about that another time. The average central is 11 millimeters. You really don't want a central incisor more than 12 millimeters long, especially if somebody has a high lip line. The occlusal plane, it should blend seamlessly into the incisal plane with no step between the cuspids and the bicuspids. We, ha we must have adequate thickness occlusally for restorations. Now remember, the thickness in the anterior is different than the thickness in the posterior because the anterior teeth don't contact incisal edge to incisal edge. So how are you going to get how are you going to get that? Well, the, as we said, the only way you're going to get retention for restorations in a severe wear case is either you can get it by increasing vertical dimension and not have to reduce occlusal tooth structure. You can get it by periodontal crown lengthening and have more tooth structure apically to retain the restoration or you can do it endodontically and have uh, internal retention. Adequate freeway space. When the patient puts their lips together lightly, just put your lips together lightly, Howard, and then hum. Just hmm. When you do that, the teeth should not touch. Now, people say you should have two to three millimeters between the teeth when you do that. Main thing is that you don't want the teeth to touch when you lightly touch your teeth together and hum. Then the teeth length. 11 millimeters is ideal for the centrals, about 11 millimeters for the cuspids, about nine millimeters for the, the uh, lateral incisors, about nine millimeters for the lower incisor teeth. So you've got to have all that in the mental computer when you're putting this together. I'll always appreciate knowing centric relation because as long as I know the back, 
is centriculation, the fronts, the incisal edge position, and the vertical dimension. As long as I've got those things, then we're just filling in the rest of it. If you understand curve of speed, curve of Wilson, but you got to get the front and the back first. So centriculation sets the back. Then the incisal edge position. Now this gentleman has a flat lip in repose. You'll notice here there's no tooth display, so it looks like he's got no teeth. When we were finished restoring him, he had tooth display. So that's the significant thing. With a flat lip patient, it's easy to determine incisal edge position. You want some tooth display with lips in repose. You also want the incisal plane to be parallel to the lower lip the upper lip, the pupillary line, and if the patient has a high lip line when they smile, the gingival line. <coughs> you always want the central, the maxillary central incisors to be the longest teeth, and you want a line drawn from the incisal edge of the cuspid tooth to the incisal edge of the other cuspid tooth to mirror the lower lip or look like a banana or a quarter moon and then you want that to blend seamlessly into the occlusal plane just like a horseshoe. Now if somebody does not have a high lip line you don't have to worry as much about gingival line. I think we talked a little bit about gingival line last time. Just touched on it. Then you want adequate space for the occlusal thickness of restorations. Now look at this case. This this individual's wife had passed away, and we may look at his case today, and he just looked scary. And it had been about five years before, and he said, I'd like to date again. Well, what are you going to do with that case, Howard? Are you going to take out the teeth and put in dentures? Can you imagine what that would be like with somebody that grinds like that? Or he'd just have to move from Dallas to Kansas and date women there. <laughs> that, that, that's where I'm from. That's, that's looking at but half you're, my you're family. A, but, you're a, but you're a good looking guy. <laughs> What's that like? Are you like Joe Namath? You remember Joe Namath? You remember what he said? The pantyhose commercial quarterback from the yeah. Jets? Yeah, you remember what he said? What? That he set his alarm clock a little earlier every day because he couldn't wait to get up in the morning and look at himself in the mirror because he became better. He got better looking every day. <laughs> is that, is that you? All right, now look at this. How are you going to restore that if you don't increase vertical dimension? How are you going to restore that? If, if we have a chance, I'll show you the first case back in the early 80s that I restored by increasing vertical dimension. And I just reread the the book of one of my favorite people in dentistry that said never increase vertical dimension and his teeth were just about like this. If you remind me, Mr. Downing, I may show you that case. I restored his son a few years later who ran a mine in uh, Tennessee or Kentucky and his teeth were just like his dad's. So you look at that if you remove a millimeter or two of the occlusal, what are you going to what are you going to put the restoration on? So, the ways we have of gaining room for restorations are either increasing vertical dimension, periodontal crown lengthening, or internal retention from endodontics. That's all we've got. And in a lot of these cases, taking out the teeth and putting in dentures, even with implants, is not a good idea because lateral forces on implants are not good. So we get to the end, we want adequate freeway space. You remember that one. Put your lips together. Mm, teeth should not touch. Ideally, you'd like, oh, two to three millimeters between the teeth when you, do the, when you hum. Teeth length. You need to know these lengths so you can plug it into the middle computer when you're analyzing these cases. The average maxillary central incisor is 11 millimeters long, 10 and a half to 11. Lateral incisor, 9. 8 and a half millimeters wide, or 7, seven millimeters wide. The average central is 8 and a half millimeters wide. The average cuspid is 11, and it's about 
eight millimeters wide. Average lower incisor is about nine millimeters long. And a lower, one and a half lower incisors equals an upper incisor. All right, so these are some secondary points with increasing vertical dimension, full mouth reconstruction. <coughs> you, can, you can mount these cases on an articulator with a face bow, which you should do. You can even do a functionally generated path, but in the end, you're going to have to work out the envelope of function in the patient's mouth. These cases are never completed at the appointment that you seat the restoration. So you remember, envelope of function is any movement of the mandible. So I, I often say that some people chew like an alligator, chomp, chomp, and other people chew like a cow. So it's like, a, it, it depends on if you're a helicopter coming in for a landing or an airplane or a duck landing on water. If they come in like this, they're going to bump that tooth even if your centric relation occlusion is ideal. So you've got to spend some time working out envelope of function. The gingival line, remember, should parallel the incisal edge of the maxillary teeth, the lower lip, the upper lip, and the pupillary line. If, you have, if someone has a low lip line, you don't have to worry most of the time about gingival line, but if they've got a high lip line, you've got to consider that before you begin the restoration. The alert feeding position is a critical uh, consideration <coughs> that many people overlook. That means when you're through placing all the restorations on the teeth and you sit the patient straight up in a chair and lightly put your hand on their chin and have them tap together, you don't want the four incisor teeth to contact. There's a little, the mandible comes forward about a half a millimeter in that position, so you want to be sure you can pull shim stock between the maxillary incisor teeth when the person's in the alert feeding position. Otherwise, uh, they'll bump those teeth every time they close their teeth together when they're sitting up, sitting upright or standing upright. You want the contact in these cases to primarily be between the cuspids and the mesial of the first molar. You want to be absolutely sure that the first contact or that the second molars and the distal of the first molar as well as the four incisor teeth do not contact in CRO before the cuspids, the first and second bicuspid, and the mesial of the first molar. That's critical. Centric relation occlusion, very important. Now remember the only time the teeth should ever touch is when the patient swallows and then just very lightly. When you chew your food your teeth shouldn't touch and then grinding and bruxing is a parafunctional habit. That shouldn't occur so the only time teeth should really touch is when you swallow and then very lightly. Facial features following restoration. Let's consider them. Eccentric occlusal contacts. You know you don't want any uh, balancing side contacts. You want the eccentric contacts on the, on the anterior teeth, possibly the first and second bicuspid. If the cuspid's compromised, the only time you want it on the molar teeth if they have an, is if they have an anterior open bite. Now remember what we talked about with the big muscles of closing, the master and medial pterygoid temporalis. If you, if you contact on those teeth in eccentric contacts, you put too much pressure on those teeth and on the system in general. The only time you want the molar teeth to contact is when the patient bites straight down. Speech is easy. Speech was a mysterious to think, thing to me back in the, in the old days. <clears throat> if you go by the fundamentals of incisal edge position in 34 years of practice, I've never gotten into trouble with speech, but you've got to communicate it correctly. If you're changing the incisal plane of a patient, 
significantly, say they're severely worn, you're changing the reed of a woodwind instrument. It's like changing your grip with a golf swing. It's going to feel different. But if you follow these principles, i.e., the lower incisal plane should be flat. The maxillary incisal plane should form a U mirroring the lower lip. The central incisors should be the longest teeth, about 11 millimeters long, no longer than 12. The incisal plane should blend seamlessly into the occlusal plane. And then the pupillary line, the gingival line, the upper lip, the lower lip, and the incisal plane of the upper and lower anterior teeth should be approximately parallel. If you do that, you've created the perfect reed for the woodwind instrument. You've got to give the patient confidence when you do this, though. Have you ever heard it said that if you tell someone ahead of time, if you, if, you, if you explain something to someone ahead of time, it's a reason. If you explain it after the fact, it's an excuse. So before you start, you tell the patient your speech is going to be different for two days. Two days only. Then it's going to be better than it ever was. Once you receive the provisional restorations, what I want you to do is as soon as you go home and your numbness is worn off, stand in front of a mirror and read aloud for 30 minutes twice a day for two days. And then you will love your speech pattern. If you don't tell them that, though, they're going to have they're going to be confused because these years they've adapted a speech pattern for saying FSV church and swish based on an inappropriate read in the woodwind instrument. Because you know, when you say F, 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 the incisal edge touches the vermilion border F at the end of the sound. When you say B, the incisal edge touches the vermilion border of the lower lip at the beginning of the sound, V. And then S, church, and swish is passing air between the incisal edges of the maxillary and mandibular incisor teeth. So you created a perfect reed for that woodwind instrument. They've just got to get used to it, and that takes exactly two days. When you see them again in a week, they'll come back and they'll say, Howard, just like you said, that first day I thought, oh my gosh, by the end of the second day, I had it. But you've got to explain that before you start. Now, most of the full mouth reconstruction cases I do in severe wear cases have a condyle that's just trashed. I mean, a, a disc that just trashed, and most of the time the condyle is flat. I've got, I'll bet I've got the largest collection of MRIs of TMJs possibly in the world. <laughs> and the key, in my opinion, to restoring a patient with no disc is centric relation, CRO. Because if they've got a slide and they squeeze their teeth together, they're going to constantly be moving this condyle up and down in the fossa, down the eminence. If you're in centric relation occlusion, so that when you squeeze the condyle seated, you're not going to be rubbing the condyle bone to bone on the eminence, and these people will have no problem, no pain uh, intraarticularly. But it's a good idea to have an MRI, I think, before you start these cases if the, uh, if the teeth are severely worn. <clears throat> So these are considerations before we restore a severely worn dentition. Are the incisal edges displayed? Now remember this only counts in flat lips when the lips are in repose. Is there enough vertical space to restore the teeth? Has the patient lost vertical dimension? Have they lost vertical dimension? You've got to consider the ratio between the anterior and posterior teeth regarding vertical dimension increase. So you can't just randomly increase vertical dimension and say, okay, I'm going to increase some six millimeters in the anterior. That won't work because you've got to fill that in with porcelain 
and half of it's got to be on the incisal edge of the mandibular anterior teeth. So you don't want a fulcrum three millimeters of porcelain off of the incisal edge of lower anterior teeth. How do I know that, Howard? How? <laughs> see this, can you see my gray hair and receding hairline? That's not from dyeing my hair gray and shaving it back. I tried it back in the day when I didn't really know how to do this. Vertical dimension must be increased on the hinged arc of centric relation, and when the lips are lightly touching, the restored teeth should not contact. Okay, so considerations, priority increasing. Ooh, this is it. This picture tells it all. You can see the foreground, but you can't really see what's down there. Consider the age of the patient. If somebody is 30 years old and they've severely worn your teeth, their teeth, you've got a long time to maintain those, pe those teeth. You better be sure that the patient understands it's their problem. They've got to be convinced that you are a world expert in restoring these cases, but no matter how good you are, just like a NASCAR, there is going to be breakdown. There is going to be maintenance. I actually published uh, a good article to read on this. I published in uh, PPAD probably 10 years ago, and it it, it talks about that, but if somebody where somebody's 80 or 75, it's not as big a deal because it doesn't have to last that long. If somebody's 30, though, there will be maintenance. There will be maintenance if they're 60 or 70, unless they've stopped bruxing. Okay, so this when this lady presented, she did not have appropriate tooth display with lips in repose. There was no tooth display at all. So here we have restored her, and there is proper tooth display with lips in repose. Is there enough vertical space to restore the, restore the teeth? No. So remember, we've got three options. Increase vertical dimension so we do not have to remove occlusal tooth structure. The second option, if we remove tooth structure to restore this severely worn case, Look at how little tooth structure will be left. So we'll have to, to either crown lengthen the teeth or perform endodontics and gain internal retention. I would never do that in a severely worn case. I might do it in combination, but I wouldn't cut the tooth down so that there's only a millimeter or two of tooth remaining. Now, your great question, Howard, that tells me that you are a student of the literature. There are some very good people that have written never increase vertical dimension. You've read that. Absolutely. Okay. Has this person lost vertical dimension? And the reason was that the patient does not lose vertical dimension, that the alveolar process grows with the teeth as they wear. Correct? That was the premise. That was a great premise, but unfortunately, it is wrong. Here's, here's when somebody, how you know someone has lost vertical dimension. They have thin lips. They have downturned corners of the mouth. They have horizontal lines in the face. The nose is closer to the chin. They look like Granny Gump. There's no tooth display with lips in repose, with a flat lip, and the teeth are severely worn. Would anybody look at this gentleman and say he hasn't lost vertical dimension? I think everyone would say he lost vertical dimension. Yeah. So Mr. Downing changed my life back in the early 80s. I thought I was going to kill him because I hadn't worked out my current system for increasing it. And I do not increase vertical casually. I don't increase it casually, but I'll say this. Of all the patients, I've in, the hundreds of patients I've restored, increasing vertical dimension, do you know how many have ever had an issue with it? How many? Yes, zero. So why do you think everybody fears it? Why is it just... 
I don't understand it. I don't understand why they fear it. You ever made a denture? Of course. You think you change the vertical when you make a denture? Oh, absolutely. So it's just something. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to be critical because it scared the hell out of me when I did it the first time on Mr. Downey. I took six months to restore that case, just thinking I was going to kill him because of the literature. And you don't want to be cavalier about it, but in my practice, I have to increase vertical dimension to restore these cases. Look at this. Look at this right here. How, how am I going to do it? And see, when you increase vertical, look at what it does for you. You can create an appropriate incisal plane and occlusal plane. If you strive to restore this person right here with this roller coaster incisal plane, occlusal plane, how are you going to make the planes right? Remind me to come back to that. We can ponder that great too. The bottom line is this is this is Super Bowl dentistry. This is really complicated. I think everybody needs to understand it, even if they don't want to do it themselves, because there's lots of conversation that goes into this with the patient. <clears throat> and you're, you know, when you get into these, you're kind of putting yourself in harm's way because the potential of breakdown is a lot greater than with putting a crown on a tooth. But you, the thing that, the thing that took me years to figure out was how much do you increase vertical if you are going to increase vertical? Do you know the answer to that? No. You increase it no more than a millimeter and a half between the second molar teeth. Because that translates into three to four millimeter increase between the anterior teeth. Now, the issue is you've got the lower anterior teeth. You've got to split that increased vertical dimension between the anterior teeth, between the maxillary teeth, maxillary anterior teeth, and the lower anterior teeth. Now, stay with me on this. This is very technical. Are you with me to that point? Absolutely. You've got to take that extra space, and you've got to split it between the upper anterior teeth and the lower anterior teeth. Now, the upper anterior teeth, where is that space going to be taken up? On the palatal, because the lower anterior teeth contact the maxillary anterior teeth on the palatal, not on the incisal edge of the maxillary anterior teeth. You with me? Mm -hmm. On the lower anterior teeth, though, where is that space going to be taken up? On the incisal edge. So as the studies show, in just a regular patient, you don't want to increase, you don't want to cantilever porcelain off the incisal edge of a tooth, of an anterior tooth, more than four millimeters max. And if it's lower anterior teeth, you, in a severe wear patient, you really don't want to cantilever more than two millimeters off the incisal edge. So that's your limiting factor. You're making the, the you can increase up to a millimeter and a half between the second molars. But anteriorly, you don't want to increase more than three to four millimeters if you want the case to hold up. Now, how, how much do you increase the incisal edge of the maxillary incisor teeth? If it's a flat lip, you want some tooth display with lips in repose. If it's a Moderately or maximally arched lip, you want a 10 to 11 millimeter tooth. And a lower tooth, you want 8.5 to 9 millimeters. So that's how you determine. But the key point here is a 3 to 1 ratio. You do not, do not increase the vertical dimension more than a millimeter and a half between the second molar teeth. Let's go through this. So when you increase it, you increase it on the hinge arc of centric relation. When the lips are lightly touching, remember, when you get to the end, the restored teeth must not contact. Say, hmm, and the teeth should touch. So these are the steps for restoring severely worn teeth. This took me about 15, 20 years to figure out. Now, I, as we talked last time, I like to do things simply. 
I'm really not interested in having the Steve Cutbirth instrument for increasing vertical dimension. <laughs> Once I figured out that you could, that one and a half between the seconds and about three to four between the anterior teeth was the measurement, I looked around the top of the counter in the operatory and I wanted to find something that was about three and a half millimeters. Well, the end of a cotton tip applicator is perfect. That's what that is. If you torque it down the cotton part, down toward the chin, just a little bit, that's a little over three millimeters. So that's how much I want to increase vertical. Then I wax up, I take an occlusal restoration record at that increased vertical and wax it up. Now you cannot mount the case in CO on an articulator as they present and increase the vertical on the articulator without an occlusal registration record and wax it up. If you do that, only the, the second molar teeth will contact when you go to the mouth. You've got to take the occlusal registration record at an, the increased vertical dimension you are going to build the case to and mount it at that with that record. Then this is what you're going to get in the mouth and you won't be hitting just on the second molars. So I thought, how can I do this? How can I transfer this to the mouth and use it and maintain my predetermined vertical dimension increase? And I thought, okay, the last teeth I'm going to be restoring are the molar teeth. Remember our full mouth reconstruction, lower anterior, upper anterior, lower posterior, upper posterior? So I said, what if I put composites on the occlusal surface of the molar teeth at the increased vertical? So I etch, roughen these teeth and etch them, place microfilm on the lower teeth, place com unset composite on the mo upper molar teeth, place my cotton tip applicator between the anterior teeth and very gently and have my assistant pull that cotton ball or this end of the stick down just a little toward their chin and have the patient lightly close into the composite and then set it with a curing light. These are the centric stops. Get rid of the wings and that's your working vertical. So this is my working vertical right, right now. What's holding that vertical dimension? The stops on the molar teeth, right? Right. There, they were set at an increased vertical. So now I've got to get through this. I've got to prep the upper and lower anterior teeth before the patient leaves the office that day. Otherwise, they're only hitting on the molar teeth. This is a note. When increasing vertical dimension, all the teeth in at least one arch must be restored. All the teeth in at least one arch must be restored. I recommend restoring all the teeth in both, both arches. The lower incisors and cuspids may be restored with porcelain veneers. All the maxillary teeth and the lower bicuspids and molars must be restored with full crowns. Now, the reason I like to restore them all is because if you've got a severely worn dentition, you are going to have some very inappropriate incisal planes and occlusal planes. This lets you create ideal incisal and occlusal planes. All right, so are you staying with me on this? Of course. What have we done so far? We've increased the vertical dimension approximately three, and a half, three to three and a half millimeters in the anterior with the cotton tip applicator, and we placed the composite on the upper molar teeth at that vertical dimension, set the composite, so now our centric stops in centric relation occlusion are on those molar teeth at an increased vertical dimension of about three millimeters in the anterior. We're going to prepare and fabricate provisionals for the upper and lower anterior teeth. Now remember, all the upper teeth must be restored with full crowns. The lower teeth from the bicuspids posteriorly must be restored with full crowns. The anterior teeth from cuspid to cuspid may be restored with porcelain veneers. So these are my provisionals for the upper anterior teeth. These teeth, these provisionals do not contact the lower anterior teeth before the lower anterior, these provi the, the lower anterior teeth have not been prepared. So these provisionals 
do not contact the lower anterior teeth. I've taken half of this space, this vertical space, for these maxillary provisionals. I'm going to use the other half of the incisal occlusal space for the lower anterior provisionals. Does that make sense? Yeah, you're splitting the space. I'm splitting the space. Now, what I'm telling you in an hour took me 20 years to figure out. So now we've got upper and lower prepped. Now, once you've completed the preps, the preps should be parallel to the pupillary line. The incisal plane of the preps should be parallel to the pupillary line unless you've got some, some previously shortened teeth on one side. You don't want to cut this tooth back too much if, say, they ground off this side and this tooth wasn't the ideal length. But if you, if you can, for the sake of your technician, you want this incisal plane of the upper and lower anterior teeth to be parallel to the pupillary line, which is parallel to the tabletop. So if they were working on the model, not on the articulator, they know that it's flat. Okay, so this distance should be about three and a half, four millimeters which was attained by increasing the vertical dimension between the second molars a millimeter and a half. Provisionals for the lower anterior teeth. I'm going to impress the lower anterior teeth. Remember we talked about this before. When you're restoring, doing a full mouth reconstruction, you restore lower anterior teeth, upper anterior teeth, then lower and posterior teeth, and upper posterior teeth. So I'm going to impress the lower anterior teeth. I'm going to build those lower restorations against the upper provisionals. Now, why don't I impress the lower anterior teeth and the upper anterior teeth right here at the same time? Why not? Too much. You got too many floating pieces. You get one, you don't have any, you're losing so much of your guides for your laboratory. It's just, what's the hurry? You know, get it right as you go. And so take an extra appointment. Then we're going to seat the lower anterior crowns and veneers against the upper provisionals. Now, what's on the second molars? Remember, composite stops. It's holding vertical. Now... These cuspid teeth and bicuspid teeth are going to contact the upper, they're going to contact from cuspid all the way back to the second molar. Remember, in the alert feeding position, you want to be able to pull shim stock between the upper lateral and central incisors. You don't want these teeth to contact at the same time the posterior teeth are contacting because they may be in a little bit of premature contact and that can cause a significant intraarticular problem if you have premature anterior contact on the incisor teeth. So be sure you can pull shim stock between the teeth when the patient bites down between the maxillary anterior centrals and lateral incisors when the patient bites down firmly on the posterior teeth. Then you can modify the upper preps, anterior preps, bicuspid preps as needed then impress the upper anterior teeth from bicuspid back. So remember, these are full crowns. Then seat the upper upper anterior bicuspid crowns and anterior and an anterior night guard. Now, as we talked about, I want the contacts to be from cuspid back to the mesial of the first molar, and I want to be able to pull shim stock between the upper, central, and lateral incisors, as well as the second molars and the distal of the first molars. Steve, do you ever, do you ever use like uh, any technology with that, like that T-scan made by TechScan? Uh, or do you think Shimstock is okay for a, you know, th this is a very complex full mouth rehab rehabilitation. I like things I can see. It's like a wax up versus a computer image, uh, uh, situation of the, I like things I can see and I can get my hands on. I know this will work. I know this works because I've got my hands on it. And it's so simple. 
you know, you can, you can use all those gadgets. Here's, I love technology, but I'm not a gadget guy. Okay. What about, what about with your lab? Are, uh, will you mount this on a semi-ingestible articulator with a right. face bow? Right. Right. And does your lab, um, is your lab a local person? Did you, no. do they need photos? We, 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 yes. Which, which, we email photos. Here's a key point that took me about 20 years to figure out. When you get through and the patient bites down hard, you want the contacts and centriculation occlusion to be on cuspid through mesial of first molar. You want to be able to pull shim stock, which is one half of one one thousandth of an inch, when they bite down hard between the anterior uh, central incisors and lateral incisors and the second molars and the distal of the first molar. Critical. Critical. Okay. Then work out. Notice how all the eccentric movements are on the anterior teeth. Remember we talked about that. You don't want any eccentric movements on the posterior teeth unless they have an anterior open bite. If they have an anterior open bite, you want it on the most anterior tooth. That takes pressure off the system. When only the anterior teeth are contacting, 85% of the muscle fibers of the medial pterygoid and the lateral pterygoid, I mean, and the temporalis and the master muscles shut down. So you've only got about 10 to 15% of the muscle fibers firing when just the anterior teeth contact. When you're chewing food and biting straight down, you want all the muscle fibers firing. So you want those molar teeth to contact. But in anterior, when they're in eccentrics, you want minimal. All right, then you prepare and impress the upper and lower molar teeth. Now, remember we talked about these molar provisionals. You roughen the occlusal surface of the, mo of the lower molar provisionals with a coarse diamond burr football burn. Then you squirt bisacrylate on the surface, microfilm the surface of the, maxilla of the maxillary molar provisional teeth. These are provisionals. Then have the patient bite down hard and grind in eccentric movements. You then come back and remove the wings Mark after you've marked the centric stops, and that'll keep these teeth from super erupting so you can do upper and lower crowns on the molar teeth at the same time. Then seat the upper and lower crowns. Now, since I did this case, we've got Emax crowns. You can use them. It's hard to beat gold on occlusal surfaces of molar teeth if aesthetics is not an issue. Some of these teeth, these cases, I say I'm building a bomb shelter. <laughs> then you want another night guard. Now you don't want a football mouth guard night guard. You want a hard acrylic, flat plane, centriculation occlusion night guard. If the patient can tolerate it, I'll build one for the upper and lower teeth. We're going to, to school the patient in what makes this hold up because they've already signed the pre-treatment explanation sheet of what's going to happen to this case as time goes on. So they've got a vested interest in not breaking these crowns. They wear their night guard every night, both of them, and they understand that these are not like a set of tires that wear out. They're like porcelain plates. I tell them I have my grandmother's china from 1910. We've got every place setting because we've never dropped it on the floor. Now, if you go one night and you've been out carousing and you come back and you say, I'm not going to wear my night guard and you grind like a bad boy, you can break some of these porcelain crowns because porcelain is like china plate. Now, with the Emacs and things like that, the Bruxer, you and I talked about that last time. You remember that conversation? Yep. What do you want to break? If you put a crown on a tooth that cannot break, Something's going to give if the patient bites on it hard enough. Either the tooth is going to loosen. I can show you cases that that's happened. Or the tooth itself is going to break. So of the things that could happen, I personally would rather for the cement to give way 
or the crown to break, then the tooth to break, or the root to break, or the tooth to loosen. That's why with porcelain veneers, I want to cement that's a little bit, that's not quite as strong as the porcelain or the tooth, because I'd like the cement to give way before the tooth breaks or the veneer breaks. Now with this night guard, do you notice only the anterior, only the cuspid teeth contact? Can you imagine why that is? Muscles. When only the anterior teeth contact, 85% of the master and medial ter pterygoid and temporalis muscle fibers shut down. They do not fire. So when this patient is grinding at night, he's putting less stress on the system. You want to be sure to tell him to not wear that more than eight hours, 10. If they wore it all the time, the posterior teeth would super erupt. This is just for nighttime wear. See, this is pre-op, no tooth display with lips in repose. The, when someone says, how much do you want? Some is the answer. It's not a number, it's some. Coinciding with a central incisor that's about 10 and a half to 11 millimeters long, no more than 12. Lips in repose. Okay. That That's was it. amazing, buddy. That was just amazing. We got a million of them. Well, I, uh, I'm i trying to expose you to these guys because I love the fact that, you know, you've been doing this basically since 1979. You've uh, your Dallas is only two hours away from uh, anywhere in America, and um, these kids need uh, guidance, and you're the man to do it. I know you got a gazillion cases. I also wish you would uh, create some online C courses on Dental Town because I know. Here's what we'll are, do. Here's what we'll do. Those are a lot of separate people in there because a lot of people take the online CE uh, because they also want continuing education credit. You want to see something interesting? You got time to see it? Yeah, what is it? This is the first case I ever did back in 19, about 81. And I'd read, I've actually published this in Dentistry Today. This was a patient of mine, and he wanted to have his teeth fixed. And I'd read the articles on never increase, you know, and I've studied different, it said never increase vertical dimension. Well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? This is primitive. This is a primitive form of what we're doing right now. I said, I've got to do it, and I thought I'd probably kill him. So I, I, I knew where I wanted to go, but I didn't know exactly how to get there. So I just started, and the first thing I did was crown lengthening and endodontics on the lower teeth. Now, he's missing the four maxillary anterior teeth. This is from, these are slides. I didn't know how to increase vertical, so I just put a permanent night guard on the posterior teeth open I hadn't worked out the the one and a half to three and a half to four thing yet so I knew I wanted increasing just enough to get restorations on those teeth I made him wear this for six months locked in up here because I thought I'm probably gonna kill him he's probably gonna die then I started cutting that off and did the lower anterior teeth. You mean locked out. in so for six months he couldn't take it out? No. It was locked into the upper teeth. I, he could squirt in between here with a, use a water pick and a proxy brush to get in between there. But I, I thought, well, if these people are saying you can't increase vertical, may, they didn't say what happened, but I thought probably death. I was about 26 or 7 back then. So look at this, look at this anterior guidance. I mean, I worked that out to the nines on those provisionals, and I would have him wear those for two or three weeks. 
Then I slowly am adding provisionals and working out those eccentrics so carefully. See, endo on all those teeth and crown lengthening. Don't try this at home, by the way. Then I, all we had was porcelain to metal. So did, I put, you, did you do the crown lengthening yourself? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we'll talk about that. Next time we'll do one on getting the lines right. So I put each of these on individually and used Zap It to connect the framework and then pulled it. Remember plastic gum? Yep. Pulled it with plastic gum, soldered it. Here we go. Then did the posterior teeth. I mean, I worked this out. It took me forever. And there's the final. On the anterior teeth. Here's posterior. Here we go. All the eccentrics on the anterior teeth. Built a bomb shelter in the back. <laughs> Now, and Nike, at the end of his life, he lived another 30 years. You know what happened to this? He chipped one of these teeth, one of the maxillary anterior teeth. I won't go into his son right now, but his son uh, came to see us years later, and he had a situation just like his dad. Okay, what else? Well, I think we should wrap this up because it's an hour 10. The brand is about an hour long on the podcast, and that's what they're used to. And if we want to do more, I think uh, we can do more podcasts. But I really think that this would best be done on uh, with Howard Goldstein on the um, continuing education, the online CE. I, I, think, I think you and Bo could make uh, – I mean, God, you guys could do a two-hour to 20-hour lecture on uh, on this stuff if you spent a day in our practice you would die this is waco texas a hundred thousand people and i see somebody from eight to two o'clock every day from all over the country they people are dying for this somebody that's trained in this kind of work but you got to pay a certain price to learn how to do it you're not going to get it in one weekend ce course i'm waiting to see some dentists that want to step up and learn how to do this and not think they're going to use a, I mean, do a podcast and learn how to manipulate the centric and how to prep teeth and how to take proper impressions and provisionals. I mean, this is a process. If you get into this complex stuff, Howard, I'm afraid people will think they can do it and they really can't. I mean, it's, it is righteous. I'm open to, conversation, but it's like a, a, an interview or a consultation with a patient. I don't want to, uh, I'm just not, I'm just not knowing where dentistry in general is right now. You'd know more of that than I. That's why I'm interested in you and I sitting down sometime and just going through what, what's what. Well, we will do that. I just, I just sent you and uh, Howard Goldstein a uh, text. Um, I think we should wrap this up because uh, that's yeah. the brand. And uh, talk to Hogo, and you being Hogo, we'll figure out what we're going to do next. Good. All right, buddy. Thank Good you so much you. for another case, and I hope you're cheering for the Arizona Cardinals to beat the Green Bay Packers today. You know, I'm going to just because of you. You're going to cheer for the Cowboys this afternoon? Oh, wait. <laughs> oh, poor Tony Romo. You know, if I was that guy and I broke my collarbone twice in the same year, I think I'd be saying, I'd be, remember Don Meredith singing, turn out the lights, the party's over? I think I would have had enough. Yeah, I know. That's a sad ending. And that's See, a good, it's, it's, a, it's something that dentists don't realize, that we make so much more money because we can have a 40-year career. A lot of these fancy NBA, NFL players only have three and a half years. I'll tell you what, this kind of practice is so much fun.